I've been lucky enough to spend a little bit of time cleaning my camera. Why does this matter? The reason why this matters is because I've offloaded a lot of other things around managing my calendar, managing my website, managing a lot of things. I use fully managed services all over the place. A lot of you should. The biggest problem right now is that many companies, especially startups, don't seem to understand that it's very easy to do. And the worst thing is the one thing they think they can do well, they definitely can't do well, is manage security. Well, let's find it exactly where that can go right by using a managed service called Cyvitar. What's happening, crew? Welcome to the show. My name is Eric Wright. I'm going to be your host for this Disco Posse podcast featuring Craig Goodwin, who's the co-founder of Cyvatar.ai. C-Y-V-A-T-A-R. So I think I'm going to leave it to Craig to tell the story of Cyvatar, but we dive into some really important stuff around their approach to delivering managed services for security, the handoff to how you actually staff this continuously once your processes are established, sorry, I'm Canadian and I say processes instead of processes. Craig is one of those people that you know his proof in the industry is being put on the line with every customer engagement. His love for what he and the team are doing, his belief in what they're doing, it comes out in the way that he talks about their, their products and their delivery and their services. And being product-led, but services originally is such a beautiful mix, something that I've really started to enjoy seeing more and more people do, where, look, there's lots of great books, stuff like Lost and Founder, about the founder of Moz, the idea of going with a service, developing products in order to fix your problems, and then ultimately creating product-led services opportunities that can turn into SaaS products. This is really cool. So anyways, I, I'm not going to pre-podcast the podcast. What I am going to do is I'm going to ask you for one, one little managed service. If you could do me a favor and you could click that like button and, and click subscribe and, and hit that little bell icon. That lets you know when great conversations like this are coming up. And ultimately, that means that you're going to be able to know what's happening, when it's happening, I don't even know if the subscription or notification thing works anymore. I think they actually stopped it for some reason. That's Google. They like to do that stuff. They don't seem to like humans. So they just take away all the human interaction. Anyways, that's my rant against Google. I shouldn't do that on a podcast. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. This is Craig Goodwin of Cybitar on the Disco Posse podcast. Hi, my name's Craig Goodwin. I'm the co-founder of Cybitar, and you're listening to the Disco Posse podcast. All right, thing of beauty. You've you've done this before. <laughs> so thank you, Craig, for joining. I'm definitely in uh, excited mode in what we have a chance to talk about. Because when I saw Cybertar come up on the list, you're actually on my companies to watch, and it's it's a rare treat when we can dive into. I'll say it's funny. It's like the this burgeoning area around cybersecurity and and offering it as a service and, and injecting ourselves earlier in the the development and operational workflow. It's new to the world, which is terrifying because it shouldn't be. But this is why the opportunity is huge. Uh, so I think the best thing we can do for folks that are new to you, Craig, if you want to give a quick bio, and we'll talk about. Cyvatar and, and the challenges that you're solving. Absolutely, yeah, a pleasure to be here, Eric. And thanks for uh, thanks for adding Cyvatar to that list. Um, I'm sure it's a it's a long one given what you do, but I'm privileged <laughs> to be privileged to be a part of that. Um, sure, my name's Craig Goodwin. Um, my background: I've been on the end user side of cybersecurity for about 18 years. Um, before that, I was in the intelligence services with the UK government um, and fell out of that when when chief security officer was just becoming a thing really um, and then spent 18 years 
building, operating, running large scale cyber security businesses um, as an end user. So companies like Monster Worldwide, uh, Ferguson PLC, CDK Global, which is a big automotive tech firm um, out of Chicago, um, and then Fujitsu um, before finally co-founding Cybertar um, with my co-founder, Corey White, um, who's based in Orange County in California, um, who's also got a long history in, in cybersecurity, but from the other side of the house. So he's been building and running cybersecurity vendors for, for 25 years, and I come from the end user side. So, you know, the first pitch of Cybertar is always that we've got both ends of the spectrum. We've been there and done it from an end user perspective and also a vendor perspective. So we know what's broken um, and we know what we need to fix to, to deliver better outcomes for, for customers and businesses globally. I think this is really why I loved your sort of mix in the founding team. It's a fundamental problem that we have in so many startups is that we attack it purely from the intellectual, like the this is sort of the scientific method and we come at things and there are points when you have to have a very opinionated resolution to things. It's, it's often how we succeed is you have to, you can't just sort of do incremental change. You have to come in and say, this is the way that it's going to work. We have to remap some of the processes, but because you've, come from the experiential side, the buying side, you know, as we, I always love, I, I'm, I used to do the customer deal as well for a couple of decades. And it allows me to approach technology in a way that I know while in a pure intellectual, you know, approach, fantastic. But will this actually get adopted and used in the way that we would hope? Uh, so really the, the, the thing that I want to focus on, Craig, is this idea that you've seen it in flight, you've seen yeah. it in play, you've actually implemented solutions, and you know that it's much more a human problem sometimes than a technology problem, especially in the, in the area of security and cybersecurity. So how did that sort of two-sided approach influence your choice to, to start the company? Yeah, I mean, when I met Corey a couple of years ago at the kind of founding of Cybertar, um, I was in that place where, you know, the industry is going crazy right now, particularly from a VC point of view. Like there are, I don't know, it changes every day, four and a half thousand plus products out there or something crazy. So, you know, I was having a lot of VC friends, a lot of uh, founder friends say to me, you know, you should find, you should found a business, you know, you should do something now, like you'll be able to get the funding, you know, you should take that knowledge that you've got as an end user um, and create something. And, and I'd been thinking about it for six, 12, 18 months, um, but I wanted to find the right, and it, sound, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, right? But I wanted to find the right thing, the thing that actually solved the problem as an end user. I'd fought with it for 18 years. And, and the kind of problems that I found were that I bought pretty much every product that existed. You know, you used to say the Noah's Ark of cybersecurity, we've got two of everything. And and that was true. You know, you'd go out and you'd you'd convince yourself as a CISO that your number one objective was to convince the executive team or the board to give you more budget. And you'd do that. And I'd do that really, really well. And then with that budget, I'd go and buy some more products, but still wouldn't get to secure. I still wouldn't get to the actual outcome that I wanted as a chief security officer, um, no matter how many products I bought, um, I still found that I needed, you know, large internal teams or my own platforms that I'd built myself internally to actually do the hard part. And the hard part was actually the fixing, actually getting to the outcome of secure. And I found that 90% of the products on the market would point out my problems for me but simply add to that list of things I had to do, add to the problems that I had to fix and not actually fix or solve any of those problems. So, so when me and Corey met, he told me about kind of his idea for Cybertar and have a, as a service solution. I said, well, look, I've done that internally three or four times over. I've built the platform that we need to build to allow that to be successful. I've been the end user side consuming that so so let's join forces let's bring those two components together he'd been running services businesses for for 18 to 25 years so knew that 
you know, one-off services just didn't cut it anymore. Um, I'd been running the end user side and knew that products didn't do it. So then things combined just led to what Cybertar has ultimately become, which is the ability to pull to your point, people, process and technology all together into easy to consume subscriptions that mean you're getting to an actual outcome rather than just finding more and more problems. Well, I remember the thing was ADT security or somebody, it was like some like a physical home security company that had a great set of commercials. And it was the whole thing of there's monitoring and then there's us, right? And this whole thing of like a guy, you know, a bank is getting robbed and someone like just looks at the guard and says, aren't you going to do something? And he says, hey, he's robbing the bank. You know, like this is monitoring. This yeah. is <laughs> like, if you only just, you know, obviously the first layer is always discovery, you know, yep. doing that, that monitoring, that observ observability, we is sort of the new catchphrase in the industry. But then from that point is being able to action on it is the, is the gap rather than just basically saying, Hey, there's, there's something going on and now it's your fault. You know, like now you're yeah. just handing it off to an operator or a developer. And it's as a complex ecosystem, right? In, in the organization, You've got the CISO doesn't have effective control over IT in the same way because they generally report up like directly to the CEO. They report up, if anything, possibly to a through or adjacent to a CIO, possibly through legal and procurement more so than just operational IT. And there's really a lot of stuff that falls under that bucket. So while they could say, there's my aspiration to achieve a secure workplace, a secure environment. This now has to cross into seven different divisions of IT and many, many other things. Yeah, 100 percent. And I, I could talk about that for days. I think, you know, to unpick that a little bit, um, you're absolutely right. I think the 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 trend and it's going to continue to be a trend is decentralization of the security function. You know, the I used to joke or half joke as I was building security functions that my ultimate goal should be to not need a budget as a chief security officer, right? Because I shouldn't need to protect the organization. It should be so ingrained into everything we do as a business, to your point, the different departments that actually they understand it. And I've built such a strong culture of security that they pay for it out of their own budget. Craig doesn't need a separate security budget. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've tried to do that at the businesses that I've always been at, which is to put the power in the hands of the developers, for example, right, where they have the tools, the power to be secure by design as they build their products, as opposed to what doesn't work, which is Craig's team coming along and acting like the police, right, which is definitely cliche in the industry. But, it you know, it's hurt us for many, many years as that kind of outsider type approach to security. Um, and then the other thing you touched on, which is just incredibly important and a lot of people forget is, is the politics associated with it. Like, how do you drive behavioral change? You know, that, that first day shouldn't be about looking at technology. It should be about going to buy a Starbucks card so you can take all the executives that you've got to influence out for coffee and build those relationships, right? Because that, that is 100% the most important thing. And and one of the things that we've done from Cybertar is, is enable that, you know, the platform that we're building or the platform that we've built really enables that decentralization. It enables, you know, those workflows to be created across organizational bounds and put the power in the hands of the people that actually need to fix it, as opposed to just firing a load of vulnerabilities and alerts at the security team and expecting them to do the hard work in chasing up and getting things fixed and influencing people. Yeah, it becomes the the challenge. I was at an organization, and this was in the the nineties through the two thousands, and the CISO didn't exist. That function wasn't there. It was, it was at least rare in sort of the Canadian world, particularly. We're such a friendly bunch, so we didn't need, we didn't need one, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, we, we see a CISO show up. And this is right around the time that Sarbanes-Oxley also was implemented. So you had, a, first of all, a functional change in the organization that they were separating out this role of information security officer. And also everybody that had the CXO title 
was signing their name on a contract that put them personally liable for the outcomes of their organization. Yeah. And it really, really changed things. So immediately, you know, the first thing that happened, as we do with security organizations, is they hired a bunch of VPs of security, and yeah. then they hired a bunch of directors, which were basically sort of their very high titled interns, and they began crafting policy, crafting policy. Quick, we, we must craft policies. And it was almost like a Monty Python-esque level of, <laughs> quick, a proclamation. And they would come and they would post it on the board and they would email it out and said, and immediately you'd say, well, we, we, can't, we can't do this. And they're like, oh, no worries. Then file for an exception. And then they built a system to file for exceptions. And you, they had created the, the sort of process spaghetti and it, I was torn, right? Because as it's going on, like I recognized what you needed to do is we need to actually look as an organization, how are we going to attack this problem? How do we recognize the problem? But then immediately I'm like, this is like putting a government into a functional organization and where they don't see the outcome. They don't see the negative you know, side effects. They just simply have to come in and say, policy checkbox. And then as it may have made it further down the organization, we would just find ways to get through the audit safely. And yeah. that was the first phase. But then from there, like we've seen it in action. We've seen real, you know, no one wants their company name to show up in the news. And, you know, it's like when somebody has their you know, the name show up in the news and the word embattled is in front of it. There's certain things you never want to have. And it's, you know, I've got good friends who are at Solar Winds, yep. And that was a tough one to watch them go through where the reputation attached to being, you know, exposed to a vulnerability carries for a long time and has a real commercial effect on them. Just as an example, right? That was one yeah. one thing where so they're in the news. So at first it was like, ah, you know, in, in 2009, it was probably happening all over the place, but it wasn't in the news. Now there's a really significant risk that it's prevalent, that this is active in the industry. Like Dark Side did it. They created ransomware as a service. This is fantastic. <laughs> you know, but how do we attack the problem? and make sure that we don't end up in the news, but most importantly, that we aren't vulnerable. Like that's the real thing. Obviously the news is bad, but uh, you know, let's actually fix the problem. So if the ransomware is as a service, then what do we do to counteract that? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head with the, and we could talk for hours about the compliance versus security debate. But I think, I think actually in, in a number of cases, compliance has damaged you know, what we would call real security. Because if you think about, you mentioned the top-down approach, you know, one of the things that all those compliance standards first say is, go and get the board approval, like get your executive buy-in, all that stuff, which makes it that very policy-focused, like top-down approach where we create mandates and then we try and force it into the organization. And actually, back to that decentralization conversation, the most effective way I've built security is from the ground up. And that doesn't mean negating the executive buy-in, you need the budget, you need people to understand what your objectives are, but being very clear with your sponsorship, your leadership about what is the objective? Do we actually want to be secure or are we just ticking a box for compliance purposes? If your answer is we actually want to be secure, that's a very different journey than creating a ton of policies. And, and that's one of the fundamental principles when we started CyberTar was that, you know, there's a ton of really quick and easy ways to go and get SOC 2 compliant, for example, like ISO 27001 compliant. And we'll help with the operational aspects of that. But the majority of the small to medium sized businesses and other companies that we're serving want is to be actually protected from ransomware, is to be actually secure and to, to your point, like SolarWinds, prevent their name from being in the media because they've lost data or been hacked or been interrupted or whatever it might be. They actually want to be secure. And that then differentiates them from their competitors because they're more secure. So, so what we've done with CyberTar is build real security in and security that actually gets you secure, you know, um, which is a big step change from a policy, creating something and telling everyone that they've got to do it. This is real world. Like, how do I 
prevent that from actually happening. And moving to that prevention, moving to that remediation is the key step that the majority of vendors in the market just don't um, appreciate or don't help customers to achieve right now. When it comes to differentiation, it's funny I lead them. I'm not going to compare you to anybody. I'm going to compare you against the industry at large in mm. that you've, you've, you've chosen to price by human yeah. rather than object. And this is interesting because quite often when we think about you know security services, developer services, all of these services, they're effectively marked per app per application, per object, per cloud target, per whatever. There's always some technical target. So let's talk about that, Craig, the idea that you're, 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 you're basically working at the human layer with, with technology and thus you price, I'll say differently than, than most folks would expect. Yeah, 100%. And, that, and that's another indication of number one, kind of that really customer centric approach, you know, making the experience for the customer a lot more streamlined. One of the things and me and Corey are constantly looking at the industry or, or taking our experience and, and changing the way that things should be done and making it simpler. When we thought about the customer consuming it for anyone that's ever commissioned a penetration test, for example, that horrible booklet of like 20 pages you get from the provider that says, take, and, it, and it used to take me, even with a security team, four weeks to fill in the technical data, to have to gather this technical data, to even get the scoping document back for a penetration test, right? And that just can't be the way it is. So what we wanted to do is number one, make it customer centric. Number two, make it really easy to consume. So therefore what we do is we use the number of employees in the organization as a indicative factor for the size and scale of the organization itself right and that then allows us to build those subscriptions build those solutions um, based on the size of the business and scale it effectively right for example we've got customers who you know have um, 500 they're in the entertainment industry they have 500 employees that never touch a computer for example right um, and we'll work with that customer to figure out how that subscription works and how best to address it and make it more um, palatable for that customer themselves we have other customers where some of their employees have got three or four different laptops right and in the old model that means four or five different licenses right we don't want to be like we want to deliver security, true security for the customer. So we bin all that complexity and we just say, let's base it on headcount. Let's base it on headcount of the organization. As you grow, we grow, and we'll partner with you to deliver security, whatever that means for the size and scale of the organization. When it comes to, you know, the mapping to importance of the business, it really is a human tally, right? Like, is it's the, the scale of the workforce is effectively a marker of the network effect of risk. Because the more people you have, like you said, there's, there's specific, you know, some employees are, you know, they've got seven devices hanging off them. They're much more active, their field work. So they may be sort of more exposed than others, but then back office folks, you know, they, they log into the computer only to get their morning email. And then the rest of the stuff they're doing is they're scanning paper into systems. It's, it actually makes complete sense. And you start to think like, why hasn't someone done this before? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's, that's my, that's my favorite thing. Like my head gets a little bit bigger because I love it when we sit down with customers and hopefully that's an indicator of a good idea, right? Because we sit down with a ton of customers and customers go, don't, doesn't that exist already? And they're like, no, no actually, no. <laughs> no one's no one's done it like this before. No one's done it the way that we're doing. Now, you know, the reason that we built what we built is because the business model exists elsewhere. You know, the likes of Netflix in in the B two C space, the likes of you know Trinet and others within the B two B space for HR. You know, why would you not have that model for security? And and that's what we've built with Cybertar. You know, we don't. We always use the example of why would I bother building a HR function at this point in even our evolution. I wouldn't, I'll go and outsource it to Trinet, right? Cause they're better at it. It makes sense. It works for the scale of business and how we operate. I don't want to be a HR professional, just like a lot of these businesses don't want to be security professionals, right? They want someone who can do it for them and actually get to the outcomes of secure. 
Um, so that's why we built the business model that we did for sure. When you looked at the, you know, obviously the first thing we have is we have, you know, team, the three T's, right? Team TAM technology, as they call it, right? When you, so you've, you've got your co-founder, you have to address, you know, on the technology side, you've, you've both come at it from each angle. And so you've got a good sense of where you and the technology stack will, will be able to attack a problem. When assigning TAM, this is really about choosing your first market. Yeah. What what is the ideal customer that you wanted to begin with, Craig? Because it literally could be anywhere from SMB up to global enterprise. There's a lot of potential. And if you're a VC, of course, they're like trillions of TAMs. You know, like it's like it's a you know, they want this. There's a monster. Some uh, Gartner esque type of up and to the right quadrants everywhere. They want to see a lot of that stuff. But you, as a founder, you have to be pragmatic about your first market. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and you're right. There's there's a ton of opportunity um, in terms of even larger enterprise organizations. I'll talk about that in a second. But if you think about the absolute target market, it's it's those greenfield organizations that haven't built a security function yet. And what, what that normally means is probably 500 employees or less, right, in, in the technology space, where the ROI, the return on investment associated with the model that we've created is quite frankly a no-brainer. Like when, when you talk to customers and you spell out what it takes to build a security program these days with the, with the cost of talent, with the complexity of tools, with just everything that's out there. And back to that original point about the CTO in a startup really wants to be focused on making their product great, not doing the cybersecurity stuff. You come in and you take that pain away and the model from a greenfield perspective just makes absolute perfect sense. And even, even you know, a lot of our customers have got a single contributor, you know, the first CISO hired, like you mentioned before, or the first security person hired into the organization. Even then, what they're not going to be able to do on day one is justify another 10 resources, unless they're right. incredibly <laughs> lucky, right? So, so to have a solution that enables them to be successful and deliver those outcomes as well in a cost-effective way, um, that's number one target, right? And also, to your point from the vendor perspective, it's just a massively underserved market. Like we talk to a lot of our partners who say, you know, anyone under two and a half thousand employees, our VCs are telling us not to touch because the economics don't make sense when you get to a certain scale. So, right. so that market, and we, we, you know, we, we throw the term democratization around, but it's true. You know, we're taking these best of breed technologies that perhaps wouldn't be accessible to that smaller end of the market and making them accessible, making them consumable because you don't need those internal resources or expertise to get them in and operational quickly, which is what we're able to do. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Like I, I'm in the tech space, and and yeah, I meet with large organizations all the time, and like they have more developers at most North American banks than the vendors they buy from. So yeah. it's it's really difficult to go in there and sort of say, all right, we're going to sort of do a ground up development of this service approach because they're just like, well, we're going to use you for six months and then we're going to hire, you know, take a team and, and make them shadow you and then build the thing you do. So it's actually often a dangerous thing, especially for a startup to go in with a, a great fundamental challenge solver because they're just going to go in, you know, to, and I mean, tech companies are the same way, right? I'll, yeah. I'll just say large, large social networks are famous for this one, right? Where they'll, they'll buy a company, buy a product for a year and then not renew. And you're like, some people on, on the sales teams are like, I don't understand. Like, why didn't they renew? Like, because they are filled with amazing technologists and they just watched what you did for a year. They it's all they needed. <laughs> they needed yeah, to be close nice. enough. <laughs> Well, I think I think the um, I think one of the real differentiators that we've got is that we started as a platform play, right? So we're not a product-led company. We are a true platform, and there, you you see it. We all see it. There are many businesses out there that claim to be platform-based organizations. The problem that you've got is particularly with the larger businesses, 
they're tied to their own products as well. So right. if you've got a shitty antivirus product and then you go and build a platform, well, guess what? Which antivirus product's gonna be the one you use in that platform, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's the problem. What we've started from is, is a very blank canvas. Like we've started from a point where we're building the platform first. And therefore, you know, if you want to integrate with us, we will be picking the best of breed technologies. We'll have a selection, right? We've got three or four different partners in each of our solution areas. And our member services team is con constantly assessing what's the best out there, what's going to get the best value for our customers, what's the best solution. Um, and the customers are subscribing to a flexible subscription, which means, you know, if one day AV number one is the best one on the market, we'll install that. If next day AV number two completely outdoes them and gets to a better state of prevention than number one, we'll change it out for them, you know, and that's all part of that subscription. So it's focused on the subscription outcome as opposed to the particular product or technology that you're driving. Yeah, one of my favorite sort of platform stories, and like I'm in product marketing, I know we have to, we, we always, yeah. it's always like, you're not a tool, you're a platform. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it seems like better marketing, but Dave McJanet, who's the CEO of HashiCorp. And I said, like, yeah. I described to him, I said, it's great because you've effectively got all these layers and, and it, it makes, ultimately makes a platform. And he goes, well, we describe it as if you squint hard enough, it's a platform. He's like, yeah. but it really is a separated set of tools that integrate very easily. And it was funny that even he was unwilling to use the word platform for fear that it would, it would, you know, have this connotation of something that is easy, you know, automatic. You have to buy one thing and then you have to buy the other four things. Their goal was ultimately interoperability, which is again, this is why I wanted to pick on this point with you, Craig. By being able to know that you're looking for the best of capabilities, the best of breed, and you are handling the integrations and the interchange, it means that I don't, as a customer, have to get locked into going to you know antivirus A and looking for the best deal because you know effectively they're going to tell me why I need them. And then they're going to suddenly become the one that want everybody else to integrate with them. I want to have a platform approach where that I can think of it as a framework that I fit things into. And then it gives me the comfort that I can negotiate with those vendors now. Because before it's, they would just, if I'm a, especially an antivirus vendor, it's the easiest thing in the world. We have 3000 endpoints. How exactly do you think you're going to change that over? It's one step away from, it would be a real shame if something were to happen to your car now, wouldn't it? Like that's a, almost a, a mafia-esque type of, of way to, but I've worked in organizations where we're like, well, I actually had 22,000 endpoints and yeah. yeah, we got it done, you know, because we yeah. threw humans at it, but it was a huge expense. It was a huge lift. It was a huge risk. So if I can offload that risk and that assessment of the right current set of platforms to you, that's a huge win in my my eyes of of why I would say Cyvatar is like, all right, this is a true platform play. Yeah, yeah. And you hit on two things, I think. Number one, you're absolutely right. A lot of those businesses, you know, like I said before, four and a half thousand products out there. Like what startup wants to go and wade through all of that? That's right. Then the the periodic table of, <laughs> of things. <and> stuff. <laughs> all, all Eric's product marketing. He wants to go and wade through that to find the one pro uh, sorry, the one tool that's actually going to fix your problem, right? It, no one can, no one does, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, that's number one. Like our member services team, our experts in the field, have been doing it for you know 100 plus years or whatever the combined number is. Um, and, and they will pick the best of breed, right? Agnostically and, and build them into the partner framework, build them into the platform. And like I say, we're not afraid, right? When partners aren't performing or it's not the best tool anymore, we have the capability and the, and the wherewithal to, to change that out because we're so customer focused. We want it to be about the customer and delivering the right outcome for the customer. The other bit that you hit on, what I think is really important. Um, we went on this evolution, I think you mentioned it earlier, for insecurity from technology. And then we're definitely focusing on the people right now. But the process bit for me 
is probably even more important than the people, right? And and that's about, because you can have the best cybersecurity experts in the world, you can have the best tools in the world. If you haven't got the process that makes those things successful, you're still ultimately gonna fail. And what we built with the platform that we call the operating system for cybersecurity is the process of security. What we call, we, we've got a proprietary methodology that we call ICALM, which is installation, configuration, assessment, remediation, and maintenance. So you go from all the way from installation of the tools, all the way from maintaining a full security program. But essentially all it means is the process of security. Like how do you get from a point where you have nothing or a very immature security function to the point where you've got something that's functional, operational, and you're maintaining the organization in a clean, maintained state. And the tools can be interchangeable. The people can be interchangeable, but that process remains constant. And, th and that's what we've built in the platform. And that's why, you know, I think we are so successful in such a short space of time um, in terms of getting those outcomes for our customers. Um, we, we've got that experience. We've got that knowledge. We've built those processes into the fabric of what we do and that's why we're driving this speed and easiness of security that just amazes people to the point where they don't believe us sometimes you know to the point where people go how do you do that and it's and it's because you're taking that fundamental approach and you're building the processes right and i don't want to talk about you know people leaving the platform but <laughs> the subscription model opens the door to a sense of freedom Mm -hmm. in that you know they're they're not locked into you which is a strong thing right it's sort of a legal and and functional lock-in is is difficult and people don't want to take on a new thing you know because there's sort of a risk there what's the thing that would they say to you okay craig i, I like what you're doing but let's just say you know for whatever reason we we have to change gears in six months and i stop my subscription what does that mean for my organization yeah, so we, we build cancel any time into all of our solutions, right? Just like any other subscription, you know, back, don't like using it so much, but back to the Netflix example, you know, you, you, for as long as you're getting value out of Netflix, you'll continue to pay your subscription. And, and me and Corey and the whole of CyberTire is not afraid of that model. We, we truly believe that with those process components, with the people components, with the way that we're driving value for our customers, it challenges us to compete continue to continuously drive value across that life cycle and that lifetime value of that customer. Um, and we're not afraid of that challenge, right? We haven't had anyone cancel yet. Um, and I'm hoping we're not going to in the future um, because we are driving that consistent value. We all know, you know, my favorite quote ever, um, I don't know who said it, so I might just claim it as my own, um, that, you know, security is a condition to be managed. It's not a problem to be fixed. And, and that is absolutely true. It's not a one-off engagement. This is about growing with the customer, partnering with the customer and being that continuous source of security for the business. So, you know, the short answer is Eric, as long as we continue to deliver value and the customers see value from it, we're not scared of it, but we've built in cancel anytime so that customers, if they really don't see the value can make that break. It's, uh, and I love this idea that you, you talk about, you know, uh, something to be continuously managed. This is not like a, a juice cleanse, you know, to suddenly make you healthy. Security is something you just, you sort of throw a tool at it and then aha, voila, as if by magic it's fixed. It's, it really and truly is an operational thing. Cause even if the choice is right today, it's not to say that that particular product or some process that you've got won't be suddenly vulnerable f just because of a change in the ecosystem or change in, in process in a month or two months or six months. So that's why it does need to be this, the subscription and the service model really makes sense to me because this is something that I want to make sure is maintained. And we, we don't... We think about maintenance as a like SNS on a contract, right? Like, oh, I can I can phone one eight hundred. I've got a problem with you know something, that, but that's really not what maintenance is about. Maintenance is about maintaining the health of the ecosystem, right? Yeah, I love I love the hygiene and health analogies. Like, I think they're they're really helpful when you're thinking about 
you know, cyber hygiene and cyber security. Like it's that continuous process. Corey always gives the example of, I don't know whether he's, uh, whether this is true or not, but always gives the example of doing the dishes, right? Doing the washing up. Like you leave it for three or four days and you've got a massive pile and it's a hell of a work to get through it. Whereas if you do little bits on a daily basis and you could do, you know, the same analogy a million times over, whether it's automotive maintenance or, you know, whatever it might be, doing those little things and keeping up with it means that actually over time, you're continuously maintaining that state of hygiene. Um, and you're continuously maintaining that in a clean state, which, which makes your job much easier over time, means it doesn't cost you as much. You know, we talk about another good example is always the, um, the you know, developers building code. And if you wait until uh, a vulnerability or whatever is out in the wild, it costs you 50, 60 X, you know, the cost that it would be to fix it while it's in the development life cycle. The same is true for general security, you know, um, across the board. Fix it while it's being happened, build it in, make it a maintenance, make, again, back to process, make the process continuous. And you're in that position where you're getting much more value out of your security program. Pen test is another great example of that. How many organizations just do a one-off pen test every year? How many times have I done a one-off pen test next year? They come back the year after and say, well, it's the same as it was last year. Yeah, of course it is, you know? And that pen test somehow makes you secure, but but no one does anything about it. It shouldn't be one-off, it should be continuous. And, you know, in our threat and vulnerability management program, that's what we've done. Yes, you get a pen test every year, but also you're continuously scanned all year round because you might do your pen test on, on the coming Monday, but who's to say six months before that, you didn't have a vulnerability that's been hanging around for the last six months. So yeah, I mean, I, I can't say enough about the ability to be continuous in that program. And that's what subscription brings. This is the, this is the funny thing, right? Like you said, compliance and security while seeming to go in the same, <clears throat> there's an ampersand between them. Like it's attached to most people's resume in that way, but it truly is separated functions because compliance is the annual or the quarterly checkbox to make sure that you've passed a test. Security is an ongoing operational process that makes sure that that's, that's happening. And well, I mean, you said pen test is one that's interesting because as we develop more active testing it teaches us to make anti-fragile systems as well much more than defensive but truly like <clears throat> i'm going to build a system so that it can withstand continuous penetration testing like i actually at this one place i was at we used to we used a product and it would do like regular scans so every night it would go and scan all this stuff and it would wipe out half of our homegrown applications because it would just basically batter them like a just denial of service attack. Yeah. <laughs> and then you'd have to restart all these services. And I was like, they said, well, can you stop scanning the system? I'm like, no, can we start developing to be prepared for it? Like it was, it was funny that integrating the, the tooling changed the practice of development. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I always like, and I was talking to someone about it the other day, I always used to just talk about security as another facet of quality, right? You know, developers, a lot of development organizations understand the concept of quality, right? They're constantly scanning the code for quality. They want to create quality products and quality code. Um, but security is some, somehow some kind of outlier from that. And, and, you know, when we started to take, and, you know, one of the tips that I always gave to kind of CISOs as they were going into large product-based or application-based organizations was borrow from what's already there. Like take the quality scoring mechanisms and just add security in as a facet of that because they're building quality code. They wouldn't for the life of them send out bad quality code. So security is just another facet of that. You can't build a quality application or product if it's not also secure. So, you know, borrow from that language of the existing business and instead of trying to be a, you know, a special snowflake on the side. Yeah. Now let's talk about the Forbes Technology Council. So this is a uh, this is a rare opportunity to be invited in to be a part of this. You're you're involved, which it's a testament to obviously your history and and your your skills and your your involvement in in affecting the industry, not just purely from 
from your you know product perspective what what do you feel is a real strong opportunity with something like what the Forbes Technology Council is able to do? Well, like you said, um, you know, the name Forbes is one of those things you grow up with, I think, isn't it? You go through school and you think about Forbes and when, yeah. where to be and who do I want to talk to and, you know, what, what's the goals for me? <laughs> so, yeah, incredibly privileged. I think it's a great group of people. You know, there's a great online platform where we share ideas. And to your point, you know, Cybertar has always been, for me, about fundamentally changing the way the industry operates, not just about creating a product, you know, not just about solving a spot problem like a lot of the current solutions do. It's about fundamentally changing the way we consume. So so I think both ways, number one, you know, giving to the Forbes Technology Council, i.e. sharing my 18 years worth of CISO experience with other members, helping them to understand, you know, how you build security programs, you know, how you do security effectively, what you should be focusing your investment on, but then backwards as well. You know, we get a ton of feedback from those council members about, you know, what they want to see. Because ultimately one of the things that we built with Cybertar was we wanted it to be a business tool as much as a technical security tool, right? Our audience in startups particularly is CFOs sometimes, it's CEOs, it's co-founders who, are not necessarily the most technical savvy people. They want a business outcome, not a technical outcome. So right. taking feedback, and you see a lot of security vendors, you know, um, will take feedback from the technical security communities, which is great and valid, and we do that as well. But also there's a massive advantage to taking feedback from, you know, senior technology leaders, senior business people who can say, do you know what, Craig? I don't want to see a cross-site scripting vulnerability in an application. Quite frankly, I couldn't care less. Tell me how and when it's going to be fixed. Tell me what it really means to buy business. Tell me how much it's going to cost me to sort it out. Tell me how I can solve it in the future. You know, and those kind of things, those ROI business-based conversations is what we want to solve as a business. And therefore, he hearing that feedback, having the opportunity to share that with Forbes Technology Council, senior technolo technology leaders really benefits Cybertar um, and, and really benefits the way we're building the platform and the business. So yeah, it's a fantastic opportunity and I'm proud to be a part of it. When you're a certified CISO, which <laughs> is uh, you know, quite often the CISO, sadly, is a, a role that they're like, it's like the CIO, which at one point when I was in, you know, first getting into tech, CIO used to stand for career is over, right? It was just, yeah. they would be some somebody from the business unit. They were just like, you're the CIO now. And they would be their, their sort of their two years to ride off into the sunset as they headed to retirement. Now it's an active function. And then CISO sort of fell into the same thing. We're like, somebody has to be a CISO, you, you're the CISO, right? Make sure no one picks up USB sticks and puts them in their laptop. And there was a sudden sort of wide eyed thing of like, how do I be an effective CISO? And it's because it's an, an, a burgeoning role. Certification is something that I think had been vastly missed. So what is the path to certification and what are ways that professionals can look at working towards that yeah well i think i think that particular qual qualification is interesting um you know i i was awarded that i think i think more widely the question around kind of experience as a CISO, to your point you know being thrust into a role where you're told to you know stop usbs being put in computers for example i think ultimately comes back to and, and a lot of the responsibility falls on the individual i, I did a a talk a number of years ago about challenging CISOs as to whether they really are CISOs or not, you know, um, and what does it really mean to be a CISO? And, and quite frankly, I don't have the answer. I don't think anyone does. The answer that no one likes is it depends, right? But what yeah. that means is when you start that job, you need to fundamentally understand why the role was created and what the executive and the business expects you to do. And make sure that's compatible with what your skill set is, you know, and, and that's what needs to happen more in the industry. It's the same with, I always say, a ton of CISOs will join a role and won't have had a budget conversation for the first 12 months. They just plow on, on the understanding that they're going to be allowed unlimited products and tools, right? Getting those things up front. What is my role to our conversation about compliance versus security? 
all right, you're hiring me as a CISO, but does that mean you just want us to get SOC 2 compliance? If it does, and you're happy to take that, you approach that in a very different way than a role that says, actually, I want you to be the technical know-how. I want you to work with the development teams to embed security into the development lifecycle. Or I want you to be the strategic leader that is the figurehead for security across our business and drive sales cycles by being better at cybersecurity. All those roles are roles of the CISO, but in different organizations of different maturities and different expectations. And you're ultimately setting yourself up for failure if you don't have that conversation up front with the executive team and with the business. So, so it's a long way of saying it depends, but as long as you're clear up front what your role actually means, that's the only way you're going to be successful. Yeah, and I think that's that's the ideal thing. Even like the CISSP, if you look at the f like the foundations that it tests, it's very wide ranged, mm -hmm. and it's everything from physical security to low level programming understanding, all the way up to you know you know much more high true technical cloud and 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 networking. There's it's it shows you what it takes to really be a security leader in an organization or a CISO, it is much more than just one aspect of it. And, you know, quite often it's counter to what we'd expect. Like if we make things more difficult, if we make things technically challenging, that's not always securing the environment. It, it could influence poor practices because if you make everything super complex and People are just going to write it down. They're going to write down their passwords. They're going to do things that will then move against the policy setting. And yeah. it becomes you're effectively working against yourself by coming with this top down of you will not pass, you know, like sort of approach. Well, uh, the advice I've always given to anyone kind of early in their career or, or moving through their career that wants to ultimately become you know, CISO in the end is is wider rather than deeper. You know, it's it's a it's becoming more and more a business role, right? It's becoming more and more about strategic leadership, about business leadership. There's been a trend in many large organizations where CISOs aren't coming from technical backgrounds anymore. You know, you've seen people come from the risk function or the project management function or the program management function into CISO roles. And for me personally, I think that's a really positive thing, you know, bringing people in with that wider business experience, that wider kind of programmatic experience and strategic leadership, I think is really, really important because you get that separated agnostic view, like boys and their toys tend to get excited about, you know, security technology and AI and all that kind of stuff. Whereas someone that takes a business centric approach and says, you know, what's most important for the business? What is it we're trying to protect? Like, what is my job here? Like all of those things, contribute to being much more successful than diving in and going, oh, I need to buy this product, you know? Um, yeah. so, so I think that's really important. But, you know, back to CIS, but it's, it's incredibly wide. I think it's a great certification actually out of all the ones that exist to get you that kind of width um, in terms of understanding when you're ready to do that. Um, but I think as your career progresses, you know, you want to know a little about a lot of different things. Like I'm not I'm no technical expert. I have technical people who do that for me. You can't, you can't do everything. Um, and it's about having a little of, of a lot, I think, as you grow up as a CISO. In the world of tech, especially, community is incredibly important and the ability for people to find a peer group. You know, we've talked about the Forbes Tech Council, which I primarily sort of aims at the C suite and the C like there's a lot of folks that are there that they can really, you know, look at the leadership level. There's others, you know, that, that go further down uh, in the org, but at the, then you've got the bottom up sort of the, the sands and the, you know, the, even the B sides, you know, and, and those types of like conference opportunities. What is, you know, if you're saying as as a Cyvatar, you know, founder, what's your community of of practice that you feel is effective in helping your team both empower as well as to you know stay close to what's really going on out in the world? Yeah, I think it massively differs depending on the team, right? So for me and Corey as co-founders, it's it's entrepreneurial organizations, it's learning from other founders, right? People that have been there and done it. And actually, 
And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is not in cybersecurity. Like I've got some great friends who are founders in cybersecurity, which is fantastic, but you'll see from the way that we've built the business, we haven't learned from cyber. We've learned from other business models and we brought that into the immature space that is cybersecurity. So therefore, when we're learning from other businesses, you know, subscription-based businesses like ourselves or SaaS businesses or whatever. So me and Corey have been very, um, very conscious to take those learnings from other areas. Um, and the other thing to remember is, you know, we read a lot of books, we listen to a lot of audio books, get ideas from those things, but don't prescribe to one single thing, right? There's millions of different ideas from different theories and different books that all come together to create a strong business model. So, so I would say, you know, that for me and Corey, that's important, but then obviously like our member services team, like they're heavily embedded in the technical world of security. Like it's their job to know what the best products are on behalf of our customers. So they're absolutely interacting in the black hats of the world, you know, the cyber security conferences of the world where they can hear, have their ear to the ground so that ultimately our customers don't need to do that themselves and we're taking that burden away from them. Um, and then, you know, we encourage everyone, one of the things that we have all done in the business is go through a course called Scaling Up, which is a methodology for building businesses. And, and we've been really open with the whole team from the beginning. It would be easy just to have me and Corey do that, right? Because we're building the business. But actually, we wanted everyone to understand that methodology, the Rockefeller methodology for building a business. We wanted everyone to know what that meant, how it operated, so that as we grow, we can be completely transparent with the whole team and everyone understands that they play a part in it. Everyone understands that they're a part of the growth of the business. Um, we do KPI stand-up calls every day where everyone sees what the business is doing. Are we failing in certain areas? How do we change that? And we have those open conversations with the team where everyone shares the learning and we build the business together. And, and me and Corey think that visibility is incredibly key. So to your point, there's definitely external communities, but there's also internal communities, you know, where, where we bring all of that together and we grow as, as one team. Well, and I think this is also, it's a testament to your approach in that when I choose a vendor, why we say the three T's begins with team, I have to depend that the company that I'm buying from has viability and it's really difficult, right? If you're like, you know, they look around and say, oh, I can, I've got 12 series A technology companies that look exciting and you know that they are close enough in their messaging and in the end, in four years or six years, there will be three series d companies yeah. and uh, like but i have to lay that bet yeah and your approach is is beautiful right it's differentiated because this means that i have a i trust that you will grow with me as an organization as a customer versus like yeah we're gonna we got a widget problem. I gotta solve your widget problem. That's fantastic. There are all there are pure specific problems to solve, but being consultative and not just looking at like, all right, I'm just looking to get to Series C and get bought by Accenture, like whatever the thing is. Not that that couldn't happen, but you're looking at growth. You're looking at building a foundation on which you can grow with customers. And again, like I said, the weird thing is. I called on the pricing and the, the subscription model early because it's such a rare treat that you know that the sense of freedom gives you the ability to be free to adopt. Yeah. It's such a yeah. funny thing, but uh, it's, it's a welcome change, especially in the world right now where like, we have to be able to adapt. We don't know what four months from now is going to look like. And just that, that sense that you could buy as you need grow in a consultative approach, learn from experts who are, their economy of scale is knowledge scale. Yeah. I can't possibly with an 800 person organization or a, a, a 4,000 person organization, trust that I can hire 25 people 
that I'm going to send to conferences every week and make sure they're on top of things and that they're doing their bloody job. Yeah. That's yeah. why I love the approach. Yeah. 100%. And I think, you know, that that's why it's so important for us. If you look at me and Corey, you know, you look at many VC funded businesses, ostensibly you have a very technical founding team, right? You have a team that is focused on product, building product, building the widget, whatever it is. And, and that is what the team is is really, really highly focused on. They're very good at doing that. And then you get a ton of salespeople who go out and push that widget or push that product, right? Our business is fundamentally built on the experience of the customer. Where we add value is in that people and process space. It's not necessarily, whilst we've got some solid technology in the platform, it's not product led. And therefore it's really, really important to us that the customer and the customer's experience is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and, and that means that we approach it slightly differently. That means that all of our team members are highly skilled in what they do, highly skilled in making the customer experience incredible and second to none, not necessarily highly experienced in selling a widget, right? Which is not what, what we've built the business to do. And to your point about cancel any time, we fail. We fail as a business if the customers aren't seeing the value and the fundamental value proposition that we deliver. So, so that's where our heart is at. That's where we focus the business is all about that experience. Yeah, because there's nothing worse when you buy a product and you just look at, so it's always the, the matrix is the same. And look, like I said, I'm in product marketing. I know the dance we do. You're yeah. going to have a three column thing and most people will land in the middle. You want to edge them towards the far right. You want to put them in the enterprise plus, or we call it platinum or unobtainium. We call it some exciting new thing. And it's always like, you know, basic bronze, iron, you know, cobalt, whatever, like we try and make it like no one buys that thing, you know, but the fact that you've got a freemium entry point all the way up through effectively scaling on keep on consultative additions to what you're doing, you're using a human based counter on the engagement level. It is, uh, like I said, it's a refreshing change. And I was excited by you know, the approach. And uh, I'll be excited to have you on when we announce your Series D as well. So, you know, mark your calendars, kids. This is, uh, you've got a lot of really, really good stuff coming ahead, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, we're super excited as well. Um, thanks for having me on, Eric. Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned it there. We, we want to take that consultative approach. We're not afraid to say to customers, don't buy this, right? It's too advanced for you right now. Don't go buy APT protection against AI threats when you've got you haven't done your basics of building a threat and vulnerability management program yet. You don't know what assets you've got, you know? So we take customers through that journey. We don't sell them something they don't need. And we really help them to build a program that's strong enough for their, for where they are in their maturity and their growth phase, you know? Um, but then from a Cybertar perspective, yeah, we, we're growing super quick, really, really excited to be on this journey. I say to the whole team, want to enjoy the ride as much as the destination, if not more. So we're having a great time doing it. The team is incredible. Customers are incredible. Um, and yeah, looking forward to uh, to updating you on, on, on Series B, C and D, hopefully. We've got, uh, you know, uh, definitely a lot of good stuff. And and as far as the the building approach to right, this is this is something we can actually I'd love to have you back on and we can dive into the the founding team relationship of a technical founder and a, and a, we'll say non-technical is always such a, it sounds almost like a pejorative, <laughs> like, but in that you're not purely technical, I'll say yeah. as a founder, mm -hmm. it's such an interesting mix and finding that match. Uh, it's, it's kind of hilarious. I'm sure there's, when we look back on it, it's always like chapter one of every book where you're like, here is, Craig and you know and, and then he was sitting in a coffee shop in San Francisco you know and suddenly you almost, you almost nailed it, Eric it was a it was a it was a pub in San Francisco instead but, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah I, I'd say it super fast it, the 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 story of Cybertar is just the founding story is an incredible one because there was there was so many factors that might not have led to it happening like I lost my father a month before RSA in San Francisco, oh, wow. so I nearly didn't go. I was very tired at the end of a long week and I nearly didn't grab a beer with Corey. Um, 
all those things just capitulated um, and I eventually did and, and the rest is history. Corey would say it was the universe. I'm English, so I'd say it was luck, but whichever one it was, <laughs> it worked out in the end. Um, and, you know, and like I say, the rest is history. But yeah, there's, there's a good story for a book there one day. Yeah, and it's it's hilarious that we, when you look back on it, you realize how many of those like opportune moments that really, truly, like you said, it's luck of occurrence. And uh, yeah, somebody else as well. He's like, so I literally just went into an Apple event and I happened to be sitting next to somebody. And next thing you know, they were backing my startup that I had never thought I was going to build, you know, four months later. It's like just by the happenstance of sitting in a seat, yeah, you never know what can occur. But it's much more than the luck of the moment. It's the it's the gumption and the the choice of the team to put the time and, and work into it. So it's a uh, pretty amazing to see it come together. Good stuff. So Craig, if people want to reach out to you and get connected, yeah. what's the best way to do that? I'm, I, I love the social media. I'm all over it, Eric. So, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter or obviously cybertar.ai for cybertar stuff, but, but I'm pretty easy to find online. So uh, feel free to reach out. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Craig. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, there you go, folks. The links will be down in the show notes and such. And uh, yeah, this was great. And sure enough, just like I said, history always tells you that if I say I'm going to have technical problems, we had technical problems, but we got through it. And this was a really great conversation. Thanks very much.